ESPN 94.1 FM at AM 930. Present The Drive. The Drive with Paul Swan. Welcome into the Monday, June 25th edition. Your drive begins now on ESPN 94.1 AM 930. We are coming to you live as we always do on Monday from the Union Pub and Grill. It's 1125 4th Avenue in Huntington. The Monday special always $1.50 bottles, $2 call shots. So if you're getting off work, well, the best place to come after work before you go home. Obviously, is the Union Pub and Grill. We got a lot to get into. We've got Marshall basketball coach Dan D'Antoni joining us in about 10 minutes. We're going to talk to him about the non-conference schedule that was released today. And the Thundering Herd has some interesting matchups, and we'll go into them definitely in detail with Dan. But if you look at the non-conference schedule, you think to yourself, wow, the Herd's going to be on the road taking on some tough opponents. Now, things get started. Herd's on the road to open it all up on November 7th. They're taking on EKU. That's a great game to have because you've got former Marshall player A.W. Hamilton, who's the coach of the Colonels. That's a great game, a great series to get started. I hope they play that every year and Marshall going down to EKU and then hopefully getting them back for return visits and keep that going. I would love to see EKU on the schedule on a yearly basis. I think that would be a great rival, regional rival of of a degree. Again, this isn't going to be your main rival, but it's something of interest, I think, at least. And then you're going to have, hopefully, some folks who are EKU fans make the trip back to the Henderson Center. Makes perfect sense, and it's drivable as well. And then Thundering Herd's got three home games before they go on the road. They'll have Hofstra, Mount St. Mary's, and then North Carolina A&T. Now, the week of Thanksgiving is going to be pretty busy for you because you've got North Carolina A&T on the 19th, and then you have got Maryland on the road on the 23rd. And, of course, there's football as well that week, so you've got a busy herd week. And then after that Maryland road trip, the Thundering Herd comes back. They've got five straight at home. They'll take on William & Mary. Then in December, it'll be Ohio. Duquesne's on the schedule. That's a great addition. Toledo's on the schedule. Definitely need to have a max school there. And then you've got Moorhead State. Always play Moorhead State. Again, just like EKU, I'm hoping that you can continue that matchup between those schools. It makes perfect sense. That's one of Marshall's more traditional rivals. In basketball, Marshall, Moorhead State, that's a big one for me. And it's building, I think, into something that's a really nice rivalry for the fans who maybe are young, don't remember the Marshall-Moorhead State battles the way some of us do. Great series to have. Continue that for sure. And then the Thundering Herd at Akron on December 15th. And then they're going to take on, on the road, at Texas A&M. They're going to be at Texas A&M. And then they've got the holiday break after December 22nd. They'll come back home, take the break get back into everything, and then on New Year's Eve, it's going to be at Virginia. So you look at that schedule. At Maryland, at Texas A&M, at Virginia, those are going to be some nice paydays also. Those are going to be nice games to get some visibility for your program. You look at the schedule top to bottom, it makes perfect sense for the Thundering Herd. One, you've got some games that are going to build your RPI. You've got games that are going to give you some visibility. Then you've got some more traditional rivals there with Moorhead State. You've got Toledo, Akron. That makes sense from a standpoint that these are going to be games that your fans are going to be interested in. You have to have Ohio there as well. Again, a regional opponent. EKU makes perfect sense. You've got the connection there. You've got some games that are going to be tough. You've got some games that I think are going to be winnable. And then you've got some real challenges. It's a nice schedule. And Dan's going to join us in a few minutes. We'll talk to him about that and more. Also, a busy day in sports. We will go over what's happening as far as the World Cup and everything else, and we'll break all that down. And, of course, get your phone calls in as well at 877-420-TALK, 877-420-8255. I'm just interested to see what the the conference schedule looks like. Uh, Really, the conference schedule is just going to be when you play and where. That's, at this point, what we're looking for. It's where the Thundering Herd finishes after that initial conference schedule for the new scheduling is what I'm truly interested in to see how that plays out. But I think this is a schedule. Do you have this schedule if Marshall doesn't make uh, a run in the NCAA tournament, getting to the second round, winning an NCAA game, being on TV that weekend, showing that they can be competitive? Does Marshall 
have a schedule like this because Virginia is going to be a pretty big deal, I think. Texas A&M, definitely a big deal. Maryland, that's a, that's a great game to have on your schedule as well. These are all resume builders. Also, I think you're going to get a lot of attention because people are going to be looking at John Elmore as well. John Elmore is going to bring you a lot of attention. If he plays the form, you're going to see more interest, more buzz in this Thundering Herd team. And there's going to be a curiosity factor as well because this is a team that was in the NCAA tournament, so they've got that going for them. They bring virtually everybody back except Idine Peneva. They're going to add to the roster as well. That's going to give them some depth, some size. And I'm just excited to see what John Elmore can do. C.J. Burks as well. He's going to be definitely contending for a scoring title, I'm sure. Conference player of the year. Well, that could be a battle between him and, of course, John Elmore. So you've got so many factors really making this an attractive schedule. So we'll talk to Dan in a few minutes about that and more. As we said, we're here today at the Union Pub and Grill. The address, 1125. Avenue in Huntington, where we've got the dollar fifty bottles and two dollar call shots all day for the Monday special. We'll take our first break. We'll come back. We're going to get Dan on the line and talk to him, get us updated on what the schedule looks like in his mind and why he went a few ways with the teams he's got on the schedule. When we continue with today's edition of the Drive here on ESPN ninety four point one FM and AM nine thirty. To the Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. We're here today at the Union Pub and Grill as we always are on Mondays. Welcome back to the Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Uh, we're going to have Dan D'Antoni join us shortly on the program. Until then, we will take your phone calls, 877-420-TALK, 877-420-8255. Of course, the basketball schedule is what we want to talk to Dan about. We'll get into that a little bit later on. There are lots of things that are going on today, and some of them are intertwined with my favorite subject right now is the legalization of gambling. Now, you know that the sports franchises want a piece of the action here. And now there's an interesting proposal going on in Pittsburgh with the Pirates. It seems that they want a piece of the pie because, well, it's kind of hard to keep up your facilities. Pro teams have the same problem as colleges, you know, trying to keep your facilities up to date, trying to keep your facilities modern, and they want a piece of the gambling money now. So with the Supreme Court paving the way, now sports gambling can be legal in all of the United States. Um, the leagues want a piece of the action. Now, they don't have the right to get a piece of the action, though. That's the thing. First of all, they're talking about this is intellectual property. They've gone through that argument, and the Supreme Court has basically held up the notion that, you know what, your statistics aren't intellectual property. And I've always been taught that you can't copyright a fact. And so that would be my argument to the teams. Look, I'm sorry, we're using this because this is a fact. Your scores, your statistics, all of this, this is a fact. This isn't some um, intellectual property here, or this isn't uh, intellectual property that you have to keep locked up. Basically, you're giving it away anyway. And anyone who is a, a sports fan knows there are services all across. Now, if the sports books want to partner up with somebody who provides stats, yes, that's where some money is going to change hands. But here's the thing. The leagues are trying. They want to get a piece of the action. In New York, for example, uh, there was a uh, proposed bill that would have given the sports leagues the integrity, feel, the integrity fee, and that didn't get much traction. And Pennsylvania plans to legalize sports gambling. The Pirates are attempting another way to do this. They want a cut of the action to fund repairs at PNC Ballpark. There are lots of public comments on a proposed sports gambling bill, and the Pirates, among the people and entities, commenting on this bill that is being proposed in Pennsylvania. Uh, you have Pitt. They want a cut of the bets. Penn State wants no sports gambling at all. The NFL completely opposed to in-game prop wagering, and other leagues want to use official data for in-game betting. Basically, what they're saying is this is the official numbers. If you're going to do this, 
give us money. We'll provide you the stats. That way we can make sure that the product and the stats and everything that we have is up and up. That's what they want a piece of the action here. They're getting into the stat providing business because this is probably the only way they're going to get some of the cash. Now, the Pirates, on the other hand, they basically said, we're in all the way on our comment. Here's what we come up with. And team president Frank Coonley, great guy, knows what he's talking about. I've spent a couple of nights with him uh, on various uh, trips to Pittsburgh and the area on different matters to, you know, talk to this man and he's he's very bright he knows what he's doing and I, I think this is an interesting way to go about it here's what the letter and the comments said without professional sports there can be no professional sports betting providing a professional sports product is a costly endeavor while our landlord and he's referencing the sports and exhibition authority of pittsburgh is responsible for capital repairs and improvement at pnc park the Pirates are responsible for maintenance and operational expenses at PNC Park, which has constantly been named the premier ballpark in the country since its opening in 2001. The capital needs at PNC Park are significant and unfortunately are much higher than the current funds allocated to them by our landlord. It goes on to read, We have been engaged in constant dialogue over the past five to seven years with city county and state officials about the need to allocate a funding source to the capital needs of PNC Park. It stands to reason that a portion of the revenue collected from sports wagering should be allocated to the maintenance and capital upkeep of PNC Park and the other sports-based facilities in Pennsylvania which provide for sports wagering in the first place. We are concerned that no such provision is included in the current law or the regulation. So what's happening here is the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Steelers are involved in some way as well. They are trying to get the government to basically pay for the stadium upgrade. This is usually how it goes. The sports team doesn't usually spend its capital on such endeavors. The owner usually finds a way to get someone else to foot the bill. It's usually how it happens. Municipalities, communities, cities, large metropolitan areas – they foot the bill. And if a team needs a new stadium or arena, usually the cry is, we need a new stadium or arena, or if we can't get it, we're going to move. And so uh, most communities say, sure, we'll, we'll pony up, we'll foot the bill here, and we'll give you what you want. Unless you're San Diego, um, you, know, you don't get an opportunity to work with your team again because they pulled up and left. And it does happen. You've seen teams do this before. So you've got these teams right now trying to figure out how do we get a piece of the sports book. I mean, the Pirates, if you look at what they spent for PNC Park, the remaining amount of the bill went to public money. You, as a citizen, Pennsylvania, you in that regard paid for a lot of this, $213 million. The Pirates just paid $40 million. So they're looking for any way to make these facility upgrades and not have to spend their own money or cut into their profits. I don't know what the bottom line is and how much they bring in compared to how much they spend, but this is free money that's all of a sudden going to be available because states now see this as another revenue source. I don't think this is going to be the great savior for a lot of states because there's only so much sports dollar out there. I don't know if this is going to be that great windfall that football stadiums and government buildings with or cut taxes with. I don't know. I don't think it's going to be. But there is that appetite. And now here is the problem. You have got a situation in which the sports teams see this as wait a minute, we're, we're not getting a cut of this. You're, you're betting on our games, and yet we don't get a cut of it. And it all comes down to, well, Vegas has been doing it for years, and now the other states get into it as well. And this is your big push to see if you can get a piece of the action where I don't think they're going to be as successful unless you've got a state that just says, look, this is what's going to have to happen here. This is what is going to be. 
mean, you still have uh, the notion that if there's an integrity fee in the state of West Virginia, that you know you're going to see some of the funds go to Marshall and West Virginia. Now, that's not a bad idea if there's going to be some dispersing of funds from an integrity fee or any other fee or any other tack on to what you're going to be reaping from all of this sports betting. But I'm sure if you're Marshall and you're West Virginia right now, you're thinking, okay, um, there's a potential here for some revenue. I know Mike Hamrica earlier on uh, a few weeks ago indicated that this is going to cost uh, a little bit more money to make sure that Marshall and compliance uh, are equipped to handle this. And I will defer to him on that only because he's been in a state where that's been a pressing issue is sports gambling. He has worked in a state, but I'm kind of curious just to understand what it is that needs to be done. What are universities going to have to do? What are schools that are Marshall size and greater or Marshall size and smaller? What are they going to have to do to make sure they are compliant? As far as teaching their students, hey, here's what we have now. Here's what is legal. Here's what you can't do. This is how you can't be involved. There are so many things. These are moving gears right now in this machine. But I think ultimately the sports books, the states can say, look, no, we're not going to give you as sports organizations, we're not going to give you a piece of this. You don't get at any of this because, well, you weren't going after Vegas all those years. I mean, Vegas wasn't paying the integrity fee, and so now they see all of this as new money that's going to be found, and they want a piece of it because they're the product. I'll tell you what, we'll take our next break. We'll come back, and we'll carry on. We're today here at the Union Pub and Grill, where the special, always on Monday, always on Monday, is $1.50 bottles and $2 call shots. we got more on the way. It's The Drive here on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Now, back to The Drive with Paul Swan on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. It's the Monday edition, June 25th. The Drive continues on ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. We're here at the Union Pub and Grill every Monday. $1.50 bottles, $2 call shots. This is your destination after work. Come on in. Hang out with us here at the Union Pub and Grill. So, college athletes, right, we get into that a lot because there are the haves and the have-nots. And a lot of this is television-related. And right now, the biggest league, if you're looking at just the money coming in television-wise, it's not the ACC. It's not the Pac-12. It's not the Big 12. SEC and then the King, the Big 10. The Big 10 they're getting a revenue distribution, uh, get this, $51 million per school. Big 10 TV revenue distribution reaching $51 million per school. It's basically here. Here's $51 million. This is probably double the budget of most schools. And here it is. Here's your distribution. So the Big 10 right now is on top of the world because you've got television rights deals, You've got streaming, everything that it's all coming together. And right now, TV has been very good to the leagues that like to call themselves the Power Five. So how do we get to this number? The Michigan athletic budget came out. University of Michigan released their athletic budget, and there was that skyrocketing number. They received $36 million in 2017. Michigan received a $51.1 million payout in 2000, and that is because of their deals with ESPN and Fox plus the Big Ten Network. And it's probably going to increase, according to uh, all the reports, the 2019 fiscal year, that number is going to increase to $52.1 million. That's just here. Here's your TV money. Here's a big chunk of change for you to go build and do whatever you want to do. Now, this is from the Detroit News. Um, Michigan Athletic Director uh, Ward Manuel presented the budget 
Board of Regents meeting Thursday afternoon. Uh, the department projects revenues of nearly $188 million, including a significant boost from the Big Ten financial distributions. Michigan will receive $52.1 million in Big Ten conference disbursements. The Big Ten's new television, football, and basketball agreements last year gave Michigan a big chunk from the conference. Michigan received $51.1 million in conference dis yeah, from the conference, a significant increase from the $36.6 million. Again, you get multiple TV partners, ESPN, ABC, and Fox. This is crazy. You, you remember that in the 2013 fiscal year, Big Ten teams got $25 million. So you've already doubled that. In 2013, you're, you've got $25 million. You are now doubling that. I don't know how you can double that number again. But they have been able to do that in five years. You know what? The Big Ten Network, not a bad deal. Buckeye fans, I remember that, were complaining that they couldn't see the Buckeyes because, well, it wasn't on their system, whatever the problem was. I'm sure Ohio State and all the other Big Ten schools are laughing all the way to the bank because they were aggressive in making sure they've got the Big Ten network on all the cable systems on the East Coast. They basically carpet-bombed television to get that network on. I remember they were doing press tours on the network many years ago. I, I took a few phoners uh, from some of their pundits and experts to promote what they've got, how the network is going to launch, and, and be excited about the programming. They were all over the place. And you know what? You add a couple of schools, and yeah, Maryland and Rutgers, maybe not your traditional Big Ten schools. That hasn't hurt. That definitely, they're getting a nice paycheck as well. I mean, that's probably the best move on their part. They're getting all of that easy money there. Even if you're one of the low-tier schools in the Big Ten, you're getting paid quite nicely to take care of your athletics. The Big Ten is above the SEC. The SEC had, in 2017, a um, $40 million distribution. The other conferences are way behind that. Now, I think the ACC, once it gets its network up and rolling, they're going to be close to those numbers. But I don't think football is going to drive that. Basketball definitely will have a major impact on what they bring in. I think they're going to maybe fall in third. I can see, near future, a combination of either the Big Ten, SEC, and ACC 1, 2, and 3. I don't think the Big 12 is going to get anywhere near that, and I don't think that you're going to see the Pac-12 get anywhere near that as well. And that's not to say they're not going to make crazy money. They're going to make lots of money. It just comes down to, right now, the Big 10 seems to have the better plan. Big 10 football is, is pushing this. SEC football is pushing this. ACC, they're trying to get their football to that point, and they're going to be in that conversation. Basketball definitely as well. Don't forget, basketball is really strong in the Big 12, but it's going to be football that has to really push this. And I'm sorry, you've got a Big Ten network that is all over the East Coast, and I think that's going to compare better than anything that the Big 12 can throw up as far as reach. ACC will have a similar footprint for sure, but I think what the Big Ten was able to do is just completely carpet bomb the, the East Coast and get the Big Ten Network. I mean, I, I can watch the Big Ten Network anytime I want to, and I don't think you have uh, seen the full potential of this just yet. I mean, here's the great concept. Okay, for all our unused inventory that doesn't land on one of the major providers, we've got a network right here for it. And it's more attractive still right now. I don't know what the future will look like, but it's still more attractive than streaming, even though streaming is not a bad thing. Streaming will continue to grow. At the rate that streaming is growing, I'm not going to be so sure it catches up to TV anytime soon, but it, it's growing. But still, just the fact that somebody on a Saturday wants to watch a Big Ten football game, all they have to do is turn their TV on, turn to the Big Ten network, and there it is. 
if it's not on ABC or it's not on any other competing network, the game they want, flip on Big Ten, there it is. And if there are multiple games going on at the same time, depending on your satellite or cable provider, there are alternative channels. I've done that before. Flip down the dial. Okay, I want to watch this game. No, this one's on the main channel. I want to watch this one. Okay, it's on the alternate channel. There you go. It's real simple. All you have to do is tell someone, hey, uh, where can I watch the game? It's on the Big Ten channel. It's whatever channel listing it is on your system. A lot easier than saying, okay, you've got to turn on your computer, you've got to turn on your TV, then you've got to load this app, then you've got to sign in. We're getting there. We're totally getting there. But right now, this is where the cash is being made right now. It is television making everything happen in college athletics right now. That's why I thought it was a good deal for Conference USA, even though it is a streaming package to get right back in with ESPN. Conference USA is never going to see money at this level. Schools are not going to see money at this level, but it's still a positive to get your product back with ESPN. Unfortunately, um, you're not going to see, uh, I don't think you're going to see much movement anytime soon. Because here's the other thing. The conferences where they're at right now, they like the numbers they have because you don't want to split any more money. You hear talk all the time of realignment again. That's not going to happen anytime soon. And again, part of the reason why. Look at the money that's coming in right now. They would have to split that another way. I don't think that's going to happen. All right, we'll take our next break, come back, and uh, we will get you caught up on what's happening with the rest of the day when we continue live from the Union Pub and Grill. It is The Drive here, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Don't worry. Paul Swan has the wheel on The Drive, ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Welcome back to the Monday edition. As always, here at the Union Pub and Grill, it's not a secret location. No, this is the location. If you don't know about it, you just haven't been paying attention. 1125 4th Avenue in Huntington. This is where you come after games, this is where you come before games. This is where you come on Monday. Dollar fifty bottles, two dollar call shots, best service in town. Only place you can get all of this. It's the Union Pub and Grill. So some um, some exciting news coming out of the Greenbrier. The Houston Texans training camp will be back at the Greenbrier for the second straight year. They're going to start on July 26th. Between the July 26th practice and the final practice at the Greenbrier on August 5th, the Texans are going to hold 10 training camp sessions that are going to be open to everyone. Practices will begin at 10.40 a.m. If you want to go catch football camp, this is um, what the – Dr. Jill Justice, president of the Greenbrier, said, we're thrilled to have the Texans back at America's Resort for another year. We enjoyed the experience a year ago, and we know the Texans were happy with the Greenbrier Sports Performance Center and the work they were able to achieve while they were here. It's a great relationship that we're proud to continue. So that's pretty cool that the the Texans are coming in, and they're going to have several days, um, of course, it's going to be free to the public as well. Uh, parking is going to be at the Greenbrier train station right across the street from the main entrance of the resort. Shuttles will be available to take you back and forth from the parking lot to the Greenbrier facility. Uh, transportation, though, hey, here's here's where you do need to bring some money. $5 for adults, $2 for children. That's all you need to bring. Hey, you can even go online and buy those in advance. That's pretty cool. Um, training camp's kind of fun. I... I wouldn't sit and watch it every day, but I've gone to Bengals camp, and you, you get the basics. It's okay. It's fun. <laughs> I think the kids get a lot more out of it than anything because you're getting to see really almost a finished product uh, compared to spring camp for the colleges. Uh, I think really once you get to this point of the season here, it's a little bit more fun. But that's a great event for the Greenbrier. They definitely have uh, got a nice facility here. Um I know there was talk years ago trying to maybe bring the Bengals into uh, Jones C. Edwards years years and years ago. I, I remember because they were at Georgetown for years. That that would be fun if they could bring them in. But they've got everything they need. Um, and really, if you've gone to Cincinnati, just to compare them. I mean, the Greenbrier have got their facilities, obviously, which are, which are first rate. Uh, the Bengals have got, if you've never been, right across the street from Paul Brown Stadium, um, they've got several grass fields. Now, they're 
fields have everything they need as far as their equipment. Uh, they, they everything's marked, ready to go. So it's it's a practice field. Nothing, no frills there. Nothing fancy. Fancy. It's just it's a field, and they've got several of them. But the, what's uh, really cool is I think they're starting to invest a little bit more in what they're doing to to get the most out of practice. You remember you see guys on the scaffolds filming everything. Um, last time I was there, they had the actual the poles up with the camera system now, so they're doing things without actually putting someone up on a scaffold. But really, if you can get yourself uh, a world-class practice facility and uh, if you're bringing your team to the Greenbrier, all the better, really. I mean, and think of it this way. I mean, it's, it's a great way to get them to a place where they can focus on what they need to do. They're pretty much away from their home base. And at the same time, they can focus on what they need to do and get things done. They're at a world-class facility. It's a, it's a great trip for them. I'm sure uh, a lot of them bring the family as well. So it's an opportunity for them to get what they need done, experience the Greenbrier. It's a great deal. I'm surprised more NFL teams aren't doing something similar to that. And of course, costs are a factor, but We've got a ready-made facility right there. Why not take advantage of it, right? Ready-made, here it is, ready to go. So let's um, let's hope that um, we'll see more of that happen here, definitely with the Greenbrier. All right, um, earlier today, if you weren't with us, the Marshall non-conference basketball schedule was released and in several games. I think uh, this is an interesting schedule because you've got – EKU, you get the AW Hamilton connection there. That's a, a great game on November 7th. And on November 11th, you've got Hoster at home. Then November 14th, you have Mount St. Mary's at home. November 19th, you have North Carolina A&T at home. And then you're on the road November 23rd at Maryland. Uh, you come back home on November 28th, and William and Mary will be awaiting for you. Then you've got Ohio on December 1st, Duquesne on December 5th, Toledo on December 8th, and then you have Moorhead State on December 10th. A few days later, on the road, Akron on the 15th, then on the 22nd, you're going to be taking on Texas A&M on the road, and then New Year's Eve, you will face off against Virginia. Wait, first of all, you you look at RPI, and that's been a knock on teams like Marshall and Conference USA. RPI isn't strong enough. Well, in the non-conference schedule now, you have... Maryland, Texas A&M, and Virginia. I think those are going to be definite RPI builders. Then you've got your Conference USA schedule. We're going to face everybody. And then if Marshall does well enough to qualify in those first five spots, Marshall then will be locked in a seed between one and five. They'll have to finish up with uh, the other teams that are in that pod as well to figure out where they ultimately will end, but they're not going to be knocked out. They'll finish no lower than five. They can finish all the way as high as one, and that's going to build RPI as well because you're going to be taking on the best teams in Conference USA if you're in that one pod. If you're in that number two pod, then you're going to be taking on some of the like teams you know, compared to where you're at. It's not going to hurt you as much. The key here is you're not hurting the top teams in your league because you're keeping them isolated from those late season losses in the regular season where you lose to a team that's maybe not as good as um, the rest of the league. They're kind of weighing the RPI down. And then for those bottom teams, hey, you've got something to play for. You might not totally be out of it, so you're going to be fighting for a couple of spots there, and you might have a, a true opportunity to, to find your way into one of the final spots. And the tournament gives those teams something to play for, so they're not just playing out the string. So a lot of RPI building going on here with the schedule, but then you look at some of the other teams that are on the schedule, and Ohio's a must. Rivalry game with Ohio. For those of you who remember Marshall playing Toledo, rivalry game there, so that's two. Akron, Mac School again, if you remember the Marshall-Akron days, rivalry game for some of you. Then you have EKU, this said A.W. Hamilton. Makes sense, you get the Marshall connection there. And then you have Moorhead State, rivalry game. Really, that's probably one of the bigger rivalry games on the schedule for Marshall. And... That's the one I'm more interested in on a yearly basis because there's a long history between Marshall and Moorhead State. 
The games are always fun, competitive. The best part is these two schools renewed their rivalry a few years ago and they got right after each other. And so there is that automatic interest. I think that it is anyway. I think there is a definite interest here because Ohio, Toledo, Moorhead State, those are games that are going to be familiar to fans at home. You bring in Duquesne. Duquesne hasn't been at the Henderson Center uh, since you can remember. So, again, you bring in teams that you haven't seen or you haven't seen in a long while. There's an interest factor there. I think that brings out some, and you know, that makes sense too. I mean, Duquesne is not that far away. So that makes sense. That's a good game travel-wise as well. And hopefully you'll see some fans come down to watch that game. And then you bring in William & Mary, you bring in North Carolina at and you bring in Mount St. Mary's, you bring in Hofstra. These are games that are winnable. I think you've got games that are going to be competitive. You've got games that are going to be winnable. You've got some RPI building going on here. And let's be honest, in today's money atmosphere where you need to raise as much money as you possibly can, you're going to get some nice paydays here. You're going to get a good payday from Virginia. You're going to get paid a good size of money for Texas A&M. You're going to get a good payday from Maryland. These are going to be adding to the coffers here. Yeah, don't They don't pay for themselves. They definitely do when they take on some of these teams. They go on the road, and they're flying to take on Texas A&M. Marshall and Texas A&M are playing each other. And that's not a road trip. That's a flight. And so you're getting a good paycheck for that one. These are games that are going to be paying for things at Marshall University. And you're taking on Virginia. I mean, that, that in itself, that's going to be fun. That's a game you can get to as well. You, know, you can make a, a trip to go see Marshall and Virginia on New Year's Eve. You might have to give up your New Year's Eve festivities, but you can you can watch, you can watch the ball drop on TV. All right, that's going to do it for this edition. We're coming to you live from the Union Pub and Grill, where we invite you to join us every Monday. $1.50 bottles, $2.00 call shots, and, of course, the best service in town. For producer Gabriel Sellers, I'm Paul Swan. Thanks for joining us. Back tomorrow again on Drive ESPN 94.1 FM and AM 930. Station.